All right, thank you. Um, so yesterday, Young Chen talked a lot about spintronic devices and materials research and how it's really important for developing quantum technologies moving forward. And so today I'm gonna to talk to you about an implementation of an atomtronic device, which has uh, introduced a new type of potential spintronic device. Okay, so current spin switching devices deal with either magnetic field manipulation or electric field manipulation. So in the case of magnetic, magnetic field manipulation, uh, you have things like spin transfer torque devices or STT. Um, this magnetic field manipulation requires a lot of switching power. And so in more recent years, there's been a lot of movement towards electric field manipulation. And so this has led to different types of materials like the ones listed here. Oh, I have a, a laser pointer, the ones listed here. It will not advance my slides, no. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to tell you about a non-magnetic, so an electric field manipulation, spin switch device that only works in one direction. Okay, so in a way you can think of it kind of like a spin diode. So the way that we do this is we implement spin orbit coupling in our system. So Sean talked yesterday about how spin orbit coupling works. Young Chen during the colloquium yesterday also talked about it. Um, and if you went to lab tours last night, you saw that we have two labs. So Sean talked about the research going on in one lab. I'm gonna talk about some of the research going on in the other lab. Um, so we have a slightly different system. We have a very elongated BEC with an aspect ratio of about 100 to one. Uh, and we have two counter-propagating Raman beams. And this allows it so that we have spin orbit coupling that's constant along the entire BEC. And then what we do is we have this repulsive potential, a 660 nanometer diode um, that is focused down at the atoms and that is controlled using a galvanometer, which is a little rotating mirror. And this allows us to sweep the barrier across the BEC. Okay, and so we, we dress our system with this spin orbit coupling uh, dispersion and then we do our experiment. We then hit it with a hammer, like I like to say. Okay, and we can, I, we can sweep this barrier in either direction. So what we see is we have our initial BEC right here, and this is separated uh, using stern gerlach imaging after about 10 milliseconds of expansion. And so we start with the atoms all in the upstate, and then as we sweep, maybe it will as we sweep, so this is an example of a two millimeter per second sweep. So it's, I mean, it's pretty slow, but it makes it so that we can actually watch these dynamics happen, which is something that we love cold atoms for. So as we sweep, you see that there's a population of atoms that actually get spin flipped into the other direction. And so at the end of our sweep, we take, we, we, we do this at a lot of velocities. So the largest velocity that we do this at is 41.6 millimeters per second. And the reason that's not an integer value is because we have to calculate these speeds based on the amount of time that it takes to sweep. And so that's why that's, that's the case there. But this is about 20 times the speed of sound in the, in the BEC. Um, so you see that at low velocities, you get a spin flip. And then as you go to higher and higher velocities, the atoms then start to tunnel through the, through the barrier and you're, you don't get any spin flip. Okay, so then we analyze our results. For some reason, that animation didn't work. We analyze our results, and so what we do is at the end of the, at the, end of the sweep, we calculate the spin polarization, which is the number of atoms in the upstate, so the original state minus the number of atoms in the downstate. You, so if you have minus one, that means that all of your atoms have flipped. Um, and then we also measure the transmission through the barrier. So you calculate, or you cal you, pretty much add up all the, all the atoms in the, that are left over in the system behind the barrier over the total number of the atoms in the system. And so then we plot this. And so red, red data points are sweeps to the right and blue data points are sweeps to the left. And so the, the big, big points are theory, little points are experiment. So if we sweep to the left, you see that they're pretty much constant over here. And the reason that theory doesn't necessarily match up with experiment is because we have some finite heating in the system. Okay, and so that, that kind of muddies the water. So you see that here in this picture, there's a little bit of uh, background that's there and that's from heating. Because I mean, we're, we're pushing the system, we're giving it energy, okay? And then if we sweep to the right, we see that we get this nice spin flip. 
Okay, so this is this is this unidirectionality that I'm talking about where you can only flip the spin in one direction. And you have areas of heating right here, which is kind of what's happening in this 10 millimeter per second area where there's a little bit of atoms left over in the pushed area. And there's a little bit up here. Like I said, there's heating that's going on. Okay, so how can we understand what's actually going on in this system? So when we have a Gaussian barrier that's moving, we're imparting an, a certain amount of energy and momentum to our BEC, okay? And this is dependent on the velocity of the barrier as well as the parameters of the barrier, okay? So the Gaussian barrier is gonna have some height, it's gonna have some width, and it's gonna have a velocity. And so to understand this well, we do the Fourier transform of the time-dependent potential. And so instead of looking at it in position and time land, we're looking at it in frequency and wave vector land. And so when we do this, if you take the Fourier transform of Gaussian, you get a delta function. Um, and this delta function tells us that we can find energy solutions that lie along a two VB. So VB is the barrier velocity. So if I draw a linear line that represents two times the barrier velocity, then I'm going to get two solutions in the non-coupled system. I'm going to get one over here and one over there. So I have two solutions that work. Okay, but now I'm going to introduce spin orbit coupling to the system. Okay, so keep in mind that the spin orbit coupling, when you get a spin flip, you also get a two, two photon recoils of momentum. And so that's why this is shifted over by two kr. Okay, and from this, from this region where I'm doing my Raman transition, I can draw again those two, uh, those two, two VB slope lines. Okay, and I'm also going to get two solutions. Okay, you like that animation? It took me a lot of time to do. Um, <laughs> so we have two solutions. So there's one here, which corresponds to a transmission solution. So a solution where you have negative momentum, but the, but the atoms are trans, transmitted through the barrier. And this star right here, which is the atoms that are reflected from the barrier. It turns out that because of the parameters of our barrier, we actually can't see the little purple triangles. Okay, that, that channel is quote unquote closed. But we can see these ones and that's what we're seeing in the experiment. And then if we sweep the other way, we see that there's no possibility to have any sort of spin flip transmission to that, to that other spin state. Okay, so that's, that's the whole mechanism behind this unidirectionality, this, this uh, one-way spin switch. So uh, our theorists, so this is by Junpeng Hao, Zhi Wang Lu, and Chen, uh, Chen Wai Zhang at uh, University of Texas, Dallas. Um, and they did, the, they did these simulations with interactions. So these are the experimental parameters. And then they also did it without interactions. And they saw that if you were able to tune the interactions to a very, very low value, you're actually able to get a perfect spin switch. This is just an example of a way that cold atoms and atomtronic devices can be used to inspire new and novel types of spintronic devices. And so we like doing cold atoms because they're fun, but there are actual practical applications too. So thank you. Here's our, these are all the people that were on that paper. And then we didn't have a group picture, so this is the best we can do right now. <laughs> uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, in the very second slide, I think you saw uh, some curve on the lower right-hand side corner, which looked kind of like a hysteresis. So do you, when you sweep right and sweep left, do you have any residual spin up, spin down? It reminded me of a hysteresis loop from my high school textbook, like that's just. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Uh, no, uh, the one after this oh. maybe? Are you talking about this one? This is my, this is my second slide, so. Forward, forward. There, that one. Okay, okay. So these are these are the transmission. So this is the transmission through the barrier. And what's going on here is that you have, so your your Gaussian barrier is made up of many different frequencies. You can define your Gaussian barrier with 
lots of uh, lots of sinusoidal functions that then create your your actual Gaussian form. Um, and so when your when your atoms are, you can essentially think about your barrier staying still and your atoms going towards it. So it's a classical tunneling problem. So if if you were to look at the um, the theoretical values for what you would get here, you would see a step function essentially. It would have a very narrow width. But because we're in this real system that has heating associated with it, we have a wider type of uh, wider type of thing happening. So this is fit with a sigmoidal um, a sigmoidal fit, and the uh, the shading region, which you can actually barely see on this on this slide, has to do with 30 and 70 um, percent of the sigmoidal fit to either side of the center. So that's just the width that's defined of the sigmoidal fit. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I had two questions. One, I was wondering, is there um, any solid state uh, uh, um, setup that uh, this somewhat mimics, or is this uh, a situation where atomic physics leads solid state? So I think that it's probably the latter. Um, one of the things that we love about condensed matter, about spin orbit coupling, is that the dispersion relations look a lot like the band structures that we typically see in condensed matter systems. Um, and so this is just a way to show that we can, the, the amount of control that we have in these experiments is super high, especially for spin orbit coupling experiments. You can tune many different parameters for those. So um, I think that it's definitely one of those things that someone could see this and say, hey, well, I know this material that has these properties. I wonder if we could do something like this as well. So I think that it's definitely the latter. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Can I ask one yes. more question? I was just curious <laughs> in terms of, uh, can you fine tune uh, some of the, maybe the barrier parameters or other things such that uh, uh, the transmitted pulse uh, is- the, uh, the purple, the little purple yeah, guy? Yeah, has, has less excitations or things, it just, you know. Oh, oh, that guy, yeah. Um, so the, I mean, the barrier is uh, defined based on the optics that we use to create it, to focus it down. Um, if we were to, have a larger, uh, a larger incoming beam. The lens that's underneath the BEC, so this is coming up through the BEC. So here's the, the elongated BEC and we have the beam coming up and we sweep it across this way. Okay, so, um, so the lens that's underneath there is a very fixed type of thing. It took a long time to get that aligned and to get it, uh, <laughs> to get it the right distance away to make sure that it was focusing at the atoms. Um, uh, so that one's a little fixed. And the other unfortunate thing is that we can't necessarily make a bigger beam because the size of the mirror for the galvanometer is also a fixed size. So you're going to have, if you try to make it any bigger, you're going to have diffraction effects that are causing issues with your, with your actual beam. So in principle, we could make the beam waste larger, but I don't know if we'd be able to make the beam waste smaller than what we have here which would be really cool because then we would see that little purple triangle, the transmission. And I think that would be a really interesting thing because it has negative momentum, which is something that is um, kind of an exciting type of thing to think you have a spin switch that moves the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, a quick comment. When I was at the, uh, the uh, previous NQN meeting in Seattle in November, there was a, a gentleman there who was doing quantum dot stuff and they were able to induce spin flips by applying static voltages to the electrons using the spin orbit coupling intrinsic in the material. So this is kind of a very tunable example of that. And in, that, in, in the solid state case, you need really strong spin orbit coupling in order to get this, this electric potential to magnetic coupling. But it is possible. I think they're still working on that though. Would you please explain one more time why the spin flip, ha spin flip happens? Why the spin flip happens? You want me to go over my mechanism slide again? <laughs> Can you show it in terms of the dispersion this time? Use the, use oh, the spin orbit sure. dispersion. Sure. Okay. So we're starting in this state right here. And the spin orbit coupling has a directionality associated with it. So when we sweep to the right, that's in positive x direction, but it also is positive quasi-momentum direction. Okay. So when we, when we sweep to the right, we end up giving it a momentum kick in that direction. And you could probably imagine that you would be able to cross over the negative mass region 
and move into the actual other spin state. Whereas if you kick it in the other direction, there's no, there's no other spin state in that direction. Okay, so if you look at the dispersion, you can also imagine this. I like using the other, um, the other picture. So the other picture is not, so this is a rotated basis. This is where the math is easy for spin orbit coupling. Um, the way that I had it before, I just had the, the two parabolic uh, dispersions just on top of each other, just split in energy like they would be Zeeman split. So that would be before the, um, before the rotation into a new basis. But in that picture that I showed with them on top of each other, that's in the regular momentum space. That's not quasi-momentum. And so then I can talk about momentum kicks from a barrier because I don't have to convert it to quasi-momentum. So that's, that's why I like to use that picture. You have a burning question? <laughs> go, go ahead. Like there's a different velocity going right and going left. Have you heard that or that's different? Oh, um, so that has to do with the with the amount of momentum that's given to the system, and then combined with that two k recoil momentum. So that transmission channel, it's a little funny. I I'm, I might talk to you afterwards about it because I don't I don't know if I have a really short explanation for that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I would really like to be able to see that because like I said, a spin flip with the opposite direction of momentum from the way that you're kicking it is a very interesting problem that I don't think a lot of people have seen. Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you about that after. Hello. Oh would it work if instead of a uh, repulsive barrier, you would use uh, attractive potential? Uh, so we have done some preliminary studies with that um, and we have done sweeping and yes you do see that you do get a spin flip. Uh, it's a lot weaker though because and it really depends on the the depth of your potential. So if you have an attractive an attractive beam um, you're going to suck all your atoms in there and when your atoms fall into a deep potential they're going to become very excited and very heated and so you actually get more heating in the system experimentally that is. Um, I don't know if you would necessarily see that in numerics, uh, but we have, we have done that, but we, we never, you know, did anything with it. It's just kind of sitting around right now. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have, uh, we'll, let's thank Marin again, please. Thank you. Okay. And uh, of course, we've saved the best for last. Peter Engels is uh, going to tell us a little bit about the Cold Atom Lab, I believe, which is the uh, Bose-Einstein experiment on the International Space Station. He has lots of pretty pictures for us. It's in space, space, space. All right, so thank you. I know I'm the last speaker at this conference, at least as far as the regular talks are concerned. We have another little uh, discussion session afterwards. And I also am aware of the fact that we are somewhat overscheduled, uh, you know, as far as the time is concerned. So I will try to keep it uh, short and uh, entertaining. So at this conference, you have already heard about some of the stuff that's going on in terms of quantum gases here at WSU. Like Sean has uh, spoken on the uh, quantum simulation of spin orbit matter. Um, Maren just told you a little bit about the unidirectional spin switch and atomtronics. We also have got a, a strong program in quantum hydrodynamics, such as uh, turbulence and shocks and all kinds of multi-component solitons. But for the sake of this last talk from the conference, I will just um, tell you a, bit, a little bit about CAL, NASA's Cold Atom Lab, which is a facility that uh, we are using for few body physics. But instead of going into the few body physics over here, which is maybe a little bit uh, too much, um, you know, at this late hour and all, I will focus more on the technological aspects because this is a very interesting uh, example for how quantum technologies have actually matured and how, how robust they can be built. Okay, so I will be talking about ultra cold atoms in space. This is a collaboration between uh, my group, in particular, Maren Mossman is involved in it and myself, uh, people from Jilla, the University of Colorado, Jose Dinkau, Eric Connell, and Jason Ho at Ohio State University together with a very talented team of scientists and engineers at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab. So you know that we can do uh, wonderful things with ultra-cold atoms, uh, be it neutral atoms or ions, in all our labs. 
And usually what we need for this is something like this. We need uh, one laser, one table full of uh, fibers and optics and a vacuum machine in the middle, and maybe another table uh, full of optics. So all this works really nicely and there are wonderful things that have been done with these quantum gases. However, um, there is one little issue or one little problem that sometimes uh, what is bothering us, and this is that the Bose-Einstein condensate, unfortunately, will fall under gravity. And so this, was, this means that in order to confine it, uh, that we must confine it in a trap to support it against gravity. Sometimes this is not an issue, but sometimes we want to study quantum matter in the purest form without the influence of the trap. So the question is, how do you do this if you want more than just a couple milliseconds of free fall? The idea is to go into permanent free fall. Oh, that's fine. I can also stand here when, if it's bothering you. So this thing comes to mind, which is the International Space Station over here. So the International Space Station essentially is continuously falling around the Earth. So if you're on board the International Space Station, you're falling along with it, and you don't feel gravity anymore. It's kind of like in the elevator when the rope gets cut. Now, one may think it's a little bit tricky to uh, condense uh, two laser, to take two laser tables and actually install them on the International Space Station. There's not too much space in there. So it's actually quite an engineering feat to condense a whole BEC machine into uh, something that you can uh, take up there. And this is something that uh, the engineers at JPL have, have done. This is actually not only a rubidium machine, it's a dual species rubidium potassium machine. And it's, it's called CAL for the Cold Atom Lab. It's a NASA facility. Um, this is what it looks like in real size. This is Dave Everline working on it. This is the, uh, the machine itself. It has got a 2D mod, which gets uh, then uh, which sends an atomic beam into a 3D mod. It's a 2D mod, 3D mod apparatus. And then it's an atom chip machine. So there's an atom chip over here that does the trapping and the evaporative cooling. This is the science module over here. You know what I showed, uh, showed you here again. It's all wrapped up in new metal. This is sitting on this part of the uh, apparatus. Here we have got lasers, control electronics, and uh, then there's another little box with some laser amplifiers. So the whole apparatus is actually fairly compact. This is an optics table over here. You can see the one inch spacing. So it's about the size of a dishwasher. So this instrument in its first form was uh, completed in 2018 and was sent up to the International Space Station in a sickness capsule. Here you can see uh, the people um, from Orbital actually pushing it into the sickness capsule. They had stowed away. And then it typically takes about three days after launch, during which the capsule actually catches up with the International Space Station. And you know, sometimes when you're lucky or if you, if you look for it, uh, you can see a, a pass by by the International Space Station outside. You can look up on a web page when it's going to happen in your area. And if it's the right height of the space station and uh, if it's dark enough, you can see, see it. it looks like a star that moves from one side of the, uh, of the sky to the other. But you can tell it's the space station because it's much, fa much faster than a, than a star. So it just takes uh, maybe a, a, you know, a minute or whatever, I don't know, to move from one point to the other. But here actually, Sean was very lucky because he did not only catch the ISS, but also the sickness capsule with our instrument. You know, this is the sickness capsule during this three-day flight as it was actually catching up with the ISS over here. All right, so this instrument is uh, installed in the Destiny module, which is the uh, American module at, uh, on board the International Space Station. And you can kind of see it over here. It's completely remote controlled from the ground. And this is quite amazing. There's no interference with the astronauts. You know, they are not working with the, with the instrument. Nobody is aligning any mirrors anymore. It really tells you how robust quantum technologies have become that you can construct a BEC machine on the ground, wrap it up, send it up there. All the astronauts had to do actually put it into this express rack over here and put some fibers in, some optical fibers connecting some modules, but there was no alignment done or whatever. The whole instrument is uh, remote controlled from ground, uh, from, a, from an operation center at the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Here you can see Maren pushing some buttons at the, uh, at the computer. So this is actually a remote desktop from JPL to the computer on the International Space Station. So it's quite amazing that, uh, you know, um, one can push a button over here and something, uh, you know, uh, 
like 250 miles above the ground, something moving at the speed of uh, 17,000 miles per hour is creating a BEC because someone down here pushed the button. It's, a, it's essentially real time. So it's such that you, you push and you see what you are doing. It's not that you push and you have to wait a couple of minutes or something. Mm -hmm. So this is a user facility, and there are in total right now five uh, groups in the U.S. Uh, are working with this instrument. One is our collaboration that I mentioned over here, and we are doing few body physics. I will just show you two slides on it. Um, Cass Sackett is doing extreme adiabatic cooling. You can imagine that if you don't need to support the uh, BEC against gravity anymore, one trick that you can do is just take the trap and make it weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker until it gets really, really weak. And as you do so, the temperature goes down. Uh, on ground, there's a limit because at some point you're not supporting it against gravity anymore. So you need a finite trap, but you don't need this in microgravity. Nathan Nantlott is doing interesting experiments uh, where he is generating bubble geometry of the uh, you have bubble geometry, Bose-Einstein condensates using our f dressed potentials. Jason Williams and Jose and Cow have got a, uh, a study on the controlled interactions for mitigating systematics and space-based atom interferometries. The idea of space-based atom interferometries is again that you may have very long observation times because the cloud doesn't drop out of your, out of your view, uh, field of view. And Nick Bigelow is um, leading a consortium on ultra cold atoms in space, they have mostly focused on shortcuts to adiaparticity. So what we want to do, our team, is to study few body physics. If you take three identical bosons and you change the scattering length, so you start with the weak scattering length and you increase it more and more and you go towards, uh, towards unitarity, then few body theories uh, tells you that they're very interesting uh, states, so-called Efimov states, that are very large and super fragile, probably a lot, uh, the most fragile things you can think of. See, if you've got typically a molecule like H2O or something, then the spacing between the atoms is maybe on the angstrom size. Here, we are talking about the molecule where the spacing between three atoms is on the order of, uh, of nanometers. So it's about, you know, not, not just few many nanometers, but, uh, but maybe, you know, 50 nanometers or more. And then few body physics also tells you that there's a whole series of these, uh, of these guys, where each one is a factor 22.7 larger than the previous one. So there's a geometric scaling over here. So the second state, and this is the one that we actually want to see on the ISS, already has got about the size of a bacteria, but it's consisting only of three atoms. So you can imagine that these three atoms don't see each other very often, so they are actually very loosely bound. And this is why we need uh, very, very cold temperatures. Here's a more scientific view of the same, uh, same issue. Say so you've got three free atoms over here, and this axis is one over the scattering length. So out here and out here, my scattering length is low and in the middle, I'm at unitarity. And so if three atoms over here at the positive scattering length come together and collide, two of them can form a molecule, which is a dimer, and the third particle can take the binding energy out. So this here is energy, and this tells you how strongly bound the dimer is. On this side over here, where the scattering length is negative, no such dimer exists. However, by the magic of few body physics, three particles, can bind, even though two particles are not bound. Okay, and not only is there just one of these states, but there's an infinite series of these states, and I've only drawn two of these. So in the experiments, you start over here, you tune the scattering length, and as you go over here, you hit the resonance, so the atoms like to stick to together longer. Therefore, there are more three-body losses, and you see a dip in your atom number. And what we are interested in is actually seeing this guy over here and seeing the geometric scaling. So where one guy is just affected 22.7 uh, larger than the previous guy. And this is going to teach us a lot about few body physics. Why is microgravity uh, very favorable for this? 
I already mentioned, imagine you've got the atoms in a trap over here, and then imagine you suddenly turn the trap off. If you're in microgravity, the atoms don't fall, but the cloud still expands. See this here. Then after uh, a certain expansion time, you can very briefly turn on at a large strength the harmonic trap again. So very briefly, the harmonic trap will kick on again. And this is instantaneously, essentially, not instantaneously, but very rapidly stopping all the atoms at the same time. So now you have a cloud that is very, very large and very, very cold. And down here, this, uh, if you watched it, this was just the same evolution in phase space. And those are the conditions that we actually need. We need ultra-cold temperatures, and we need very dilute clouds. Ultra-cold temperatures, because these guys that we are, these three-body um, bound states are very fragile. Very low densities we want, because we don't want any perturbing atoms in between the two atoms that are bound together. So we want it in the purest form. This is essentially uh, the scientific part of my talk. Um, it turns out that unfortunately, I had missed the first uh, rocket launch. I was not able to go there. But just in December, so uh, December a couple of weeks ago, an upgraded version of the science module was sent up to the ISS. This one is a little bit different because it has got atom interferometry capabilities built into it. Unfortunately, I was able to go to the rocket launch there. So at the very end of this conference, I'll just show you some, uh, some nice pictures from a rocket launch to round it out, right? So uh, this is uh, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral. This is launch pad number 40, which is famous also for the Cassini-Huygens mission, which went up to Saturn. Um, what we see here is uh, the team from JPL, or team members from the JPL. This is me. In the background, you see a uh, Falcon 9 rocket. That's from SpaceX, SpaceX Falcon 9. These rods over here, they are just for lightning control. This was in the very early morning. Now, the SpaceX rockets, they are special in the sense they use a load and go procedure, which means they are fueled up just until three minutes before launch, which means when you're they are very early, maybe they allow you to actually go to the launch pad and see the rocket. If this had been full of rocket fuel, there would be no way that we would have been allowed to go there. So then, uh, you know, the rocket gets prepared, and at the end, there's about 65,000 gallons of liquid oxygen and about 39,000 gallons, uh, gallons of RP-1 rocket fuel in this thing. And the lift off weight is about 1,200,000 pounds. And so here we are. This is uh, about five hours later. You can see there's a nice countdown over here. It's getting more and more interesting. OK, there goes the rocket. And up it flies. If you watch a rocket launch from a couple of miles a distance, it's quite amazing because this thing lifts up and you hear nothing, total silence. And then after a couple of seconds, the sound revives first as a low rumbling and then it gets louder and louder with a nice crackling sound. So the rocket is a two stage rocket. You can see the first and the second stage over here, where the first stage is designed to push you through the atmosphere. Then up there, the aerodynamics change, and the second rock, the second stage takes over and, and pushes you out under your orbit. The uh, first stage, after about seven or eight minutes into the flight, returns to Earth and lands on a drone ship that's out in the Atlantic Ocean. So this is from an earlier mission. This is from CRS-8. We were CRS-19, but it worked the same way. So here you can see. Uh, the first stage actually coming down, landing on the drone ship, while the second stage is still up in space and on its way. Right now it's at 18,000 kilometers per hour. Eventually, this is going to be 27,000 kilometers per hour to catch up with the International Space Station. So then the uh, capsule moves on. This is the Dragon capsule from, uh, from uh, SpaceX. And this is a picture from the International Space Station up in 250 miles, looking down onto Earth with the, uh, with the Dragon capsule cruising below it. So the space station and the Dragon in this picture, they are cruising along together at 17,000 miles per hour. Then in a couple of steps, the, uh, the capsule actually approaches further, uh, closer and closer to the International Space Station, always in steps until it's finally captured by a robotic arm and put onto, the, uh, onto a dock. 
So this procedure is called dock, uh, berthing as opposed to docking. Here we see uh, Christina, uh, Christina Koch, Expedition 61 flight engineer on board the International Space Station as she's actually installing the uh, science module three in one of these express racks, express racks in the destiny module. This was actually January 28, uh, 2020. So just a few uh, days ago, uh, two weeks ago actually. Yep. And then as of uh, February 14, uh, this instrument has again created its first BEC. So it's just been about two weeks after the unwrapping on board the ISS that uh, the JPL team was able to make it work again and get BECs. So it's actually a testimony for how stable this, this device is. Then um, the, Cygnus, uh, the, the Dragon capsule actually gets filled up with stuff that you don't want on the ISS anymore and it returns to Earth. So it's not uh, glowing, it's not burning up in the atmosphere, but it's actually uh, coming down. And then it's landing here in the ocean. This is actually from Demo 1 mission in March, but uh, our capsule was recaptured as well. This is uh, the Dragon 90 from our mission. Okay, lands over here and then is uh, retrieved. Mm -hmm. Now, just for clarification, I should say our instrument was not the only one on the SpaceX, right? So there were in total 40 different uh, experiments that the, space, that the Falcon 9 rocket actually launched at that time. We were just one part of it. Okay, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your, uh, for your, uh, for being here. And I should also say special thanks because this is kind of like the uh, end of the program, except for the uh, discussion session that we have. I want to express special thanks to my colleagues from the organizing team, including Sean and Michael and Deep Gupta, Boris Binov and Brent van der Wender. I think it was a very nice uh, conference for all of us and thank you for having helped to uh, make it this event. I want to thank Robin Stratton from WSU Physics and Astronomy Administration who had to put out many fires also in the last minutes. Um, I thank the WSU Office of Research, in particular Vice President uh, Chris Keen and Assistant Vice President Peter Dutta. Um, the staff at WSU OWAP, in particular Emily Brashier, who helped us with the conference organization and made, made sure that the uh, food is on the table and all. Uh, I want to thank the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the WSU Office of Research for their financial support of, of this event. So they have uh, ponied up for the food and for the poster boards and for the, for, the, uh, for the boom over here and more. And most important, I want to thank all of you for having come here uh, to this workshop and having made it such an interesting event. Without you, we couldn't have done it. All right, thank you very much. And with this, I'll hand the mic over to Michael. Oh, questions, questions. I was too ahead of myself, yeah. Did the first science package, the original one, come down with the uh, uh, returning uh, capsule? No, I think it's still up there as an orbital replacement unit. Oh. So, on the ISS, you have got ORUs, orbital replacement units, for things that may break or that you might need at some point, just stowed away somewhere. Yeah. But in principle, they could, they could have uh, taken it down. Awesome. Um, I was just curious what the astronauts think about BEC on their, so near to them, and what do they actually, and, and also the day-to-day, -day, what do they actually do as far as that instrument is concerned? So one was like a psychological thing. What do they think about it? Mm -hmm. Are you about about <laughs> I think they know, they probably think it's super cool. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. They, but they don't have to interfere with the machine at any, in any, at all. In fact, if there's any, intervention needed, like a change of a microwave slice or something, you have to schedule astronaut time specifically, uh, specifically for this. But on normal operations, you know, it's just uh, all done from the ground.
Jesus ist gerade auf Bayer Brücke, der weiß, wo er die Rückkehr der Sache braucht. Und er sagt, das ist wunderbar, dass die Leben zu Hause sind, dann werden wir sie sehr wieder haben. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is, how much is just the module cost? Like, it's not the launch cost and stuff like that and the, you know, staff time to, to build it, but just like the equipment. Like, is it way more expensive than what you have in your lab or? The, the basic design of the instrument, uh, so the vacuum parts are from Cold Quantra. So this 2D mod, uh, 3D mod system, that's a Cold, cold Quantra system. Um, all the electronics are custom designed essentially. The lasers have been uh, stripped of their original electronics and have been redesigned by electronical engineers at JPL. Um, there's uh, new metal shielding around it. There are designs for you know, how you make these mirrors very stable that were taken from a previous mission, so it's hard to say how you would actually factor it in. You know? So the whole project, and then there's costs like the launch, however, they also get factored in with other, with other things. You know? It's not like our project or this collaboration would have had to pay for the launch because the rocket was going anyways, and so you know, it was already paid for by NASA. So it's really hard to say what the what the total budget is. One number I can give you is uh, the installation mindset was uh, about 18 hours. One may ask how much does it cost to have one astronaut working for 18 hours? But so that is a number on which you would, would not find any official numbers because it's hard to assess, right? But if you take the whole cost of the mission, divide it the time for uh, one astronaut, you know, and, and all the cost of the Earth, However, that doesn't mean that you know this project would have had to pay it because the astronauts are up there anyway. So, so it's, it's hard to say in this kind of business how much something really costs. And the other question I had is, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it went to the ISS because you already have power supplies and all that stuff. But if you wanted to do like really precise thermometry, I might imagine it's useful to have a satellite that you just have a BEC on and don't have like all the ventilation stuff like that. So is there anything going in that direction? Are you just going to have like a, a BEC satellite? Um, I don't think there are specific, uh, specific ideas for a BEC satellite, but certainly for atom interferometry in space, like ESA and all these things. Um, what we think about this instrument, it's in many ways, it's a pathfinder instrument. You know, you're correct that uh, the ISS is not the ideal space for some of the applications. It's a pretty noisy environment. There's a lot of vibrations in there. But it also doesn't have any issues with radiation and so you know, radiation damage because it's not out very far. You know, it's like 250 miles, you don't run into issues with radiation. And you can still take the things down. Now before this, uh, before this experiment, there were no space, set, space certified lasers as far as I know. So there was a lot of pioneering work done over here. So it is conceivable that at some point in the future, this will progress into like a, like, like a satellite mission or something. But for the purpose of demonstrating really that you can make a BEC or a quantum gas out in space, the ISS was the ideal space. There have been kind of precursor experiments done by German groups where they had BECs and drop towers. So in Bremen, there's a famous drop tower where they have got capsules and the capsule can drop down and then it plunges into a bath of styrofoam beads. You know? And so they get maybe a four seconds of drop time or if they do a the catapult node, they get maybe nine, uh, nine seconds of microgravity, but then they have to retrieve the capsule and they maybe get something like three shots a day. Whereas here it's 24 seven. Then there have been other uh, missions where actually a BEC machine was, was put on a sounding rocket. So a BEC uh, was uh, put into a rocket, the rocket was a sounding rocket, which means it went up and then came down and was retrieved somewhere. This also gave, uh, I think, six minutes of uh, microgravity. That was also from the German DLR team. But this is really the first installation in the ISS where you've got permanent uh, microgravity. <laughs> so I, I was curious about the bubbles, the se second or third experiment. So wh what it, can you tell them what's a BEC bubble? Um, it's a BEC that lives on a shell potential. So instead of having a uh, <coughs> instead of having a BEC that's in a harmonic path, which is like a filled wall, imagine you can make a BEC that just lives lives in a path, which is 
to expect that. So it's a different topology because now you've got like something that ideally it's two dimensional and you've got a curved surface and you want to know not like um, how, how a vortices, for example, can move around on these things. <coughs> now you can adiabatically transform the harmonic trap into a shell trap uh, by using RF dressing. So we usually in our community, we use um, our FD deprivation by running a micro, uh, by running a radio frequency frequency that couples a BEC in an attractive potential to a BEC in a repulsive potential. Yeah. So then the atoms go into the repulsive potential; they are kicked out of the trap. This is what we do routinely. If you look at this in a dressed state, you can say the two points of the parabolas where a couple between, they are equivalent some, to some degree in, in energy. So I can shift these two parameters. If I would drive the RF frequency not from high values in a way above the BEC, then cutting into the BEC, but if I drive the RF frequency from below frequencies, from the bottom up, then I end up in the shell potential. So you can adiabatically transform your trap into this uh, shell potential. Uh, you mentioned you're hoping to see these FMOV states in the microgravity. I'm curious, is there any idea of how big of an FMOV state you'll be able to see in the space station? Yeah, yeah. So there, um, we're specifically targeting the, uh, the second FMOV state uh, using potassium 39, uh, the second one. Um, that's really the only one that's realistic to see. I mean, the, ground, the first one is fine. You know, the first one you can catch on the ground too. The second one, uh, if you want to do it in a clean way, you, you have to go to space. Uh, people in CESIM have uh, seen the second FMOV state also on the ground, but that was at the temperature range that's not so clear cut. Anything going beyond it is out of reach in terms of the temperatures and densities that you would need. But, you know, this picture is simplistic. Uh, in addition to, in addition to uh, these uh, three body states over here, there are also two associated four-body states, so-called tetramers, and then there are also higher order states, about five, six, and identified up to 13. So there's, you know, this is just the most simplest picture to convey the idea. In reality, there's much, much more stuff that we can do there. Okay. Any other questions for Peter? Uh, uh, this is minus a zero squared plus one fourth over R squared. But it has to do with the mass ratio, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is R for neutral masses. You can also think about uh, two heavier environments particle that changes the that changes the 22.7. Also, if you leave this universal regime, you know, this is uh, for one over R squared potential. But no potential is perfectly one over R squared, because if you go to smaller and smaller distances, something has to bend around. So that, destroy, that uh, affects a little bit your universality of the idea. Normally you would say, yeah, I get, you know, the, the fantastic effect about the FMO physics is I've got three particles that don't see each other very well, and they only interact when they collide with each other, which is a short-range interaction. But somehow they can uh, uh, all conspire so that you see a long-range one over R squared potential. This is because one particle can convey interactions between the other two. And once you have got this one over R squared potential, everything falls, uh, you know, falls into place. And then you get out that you, you know, have all the scaling properties. And so if you would use uh, two heavy and one light, it would still exist, but with a different ratio. Maybe it makes it easier to see, but maybe it makes it diffi more difficult to interpret for the theorists. And because of this lack of universality when you go to uh, very short distances, the first state the spacing between the first and the second is actually not exactly 22.7. This is only in the ideal case. And measuring that deviation is very interesting for, yeah. Um, yeah. 
and that's well, part of the theorist's uh, interest. One easy way to see why there's a scale invariance in the Schrodinger equation for the one over r squared potential is think about the, the way that uh, the kinetic energy scales with, with Planck, right? It looks like d by dx squared, right? So if I scale the x parameter, that goes as one over x squared. So does the potential. So the entire Schrodinger equation is invariant into that scaling. And that's where you get this geometric scaling of the energy mm -hmm. scale. It's a really cool system. It's fun. Well, that was, that was, no. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, it is the same potential you would get with the interaction between a point dipole and a monopole. But that doesn't happen. <laughs> right. All right, thank you guys very much. Thanks, Peter, again. So our, our last item is a quick discussion. I mean, we're, we've run over our time, but if you guys want to hang around and talk for a little bit longer, and Michael, you have specific questions you wanted to get to, right? Okay. Yeah, so I'll turn that on and maybe just a quick informal discussion as we, uh, as we break up for the, for the workshop. Thank you, guys. Test. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, does anyone want to start in with uh, what you foresee in the next five to ten years? What certain things will certainly work? What may work? What will require a miracle? Really like to see. Okay. I think qubit more as well. The super connected qubit more as well. Probably will hold for another five or ten years. Something we haven't talked about much during this uh, workshop is the new technology of neutral atoms, pleaser traps. Uh, I already said pleaser traps. That's a technology that's in its very nascent stage. It'll be interesting to see how that scales in the next five to ten years. It's not clear how quickly. So, am I correct in thinking that the uh, the main challenge there is loading the ground the emotional ground state of the tweezers? That's a definitely challenge. Mm -hmm. um, various groups are trying to make advances there. Mm -hmm. What other groups? <coughs> so, that it's the leading group so far has been the Harvard and I. Well, Mostly Harvard combination. Harvard and Lucian, Vladimir Lucian, Marcus Greiner. But uh, there's other groups uh, that have spawned mostly from the Harvard 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 Harvard